So what I noticed when I look at these boundaries is the place where I saw a high countess boundary, the edge of each tile lies right along that boundary. So the macroscopic structure um, of the sharp boundary has influenced the microscopic structure of how each individual tile lies. Whereas I saw a color gradation basically along here, but when I look up close, I can't see that anymore. I've somehow lost the detail and the individual tiles don't seem to have any relationship. So the basic moral here is that when you build something large out of small pieces, that macroscopic structure has a profound influence on how the microscopic structure has to line up. And that's a theme that recurs throughout mathematics. Now as we walk back out, I want you to pick a region um, of, that's of a fairly uniform color and just take a look at, at how that looks when you're looking close up. And then we're gonna walk back uh, over to the awning and I want you to then look at that same region from a distance. When you look back at the region that you uh, were looking at, I think what you'll see is more of an overall impression of a single color rather than from close up we saw one individual color. And so that brings us to the question of color mixing which is obviously very important in the arts and we get this diagram that some of you may be familiar with, the color wheel. And we can use this as a tool to understand adding color. And you could ask, is adding color something that has anything to do with mathematics or is it just that we're reusing the word? And the answer is no, it can be analyzed very mathematically and we can use the mathematics to help us appreciate the art and the color they're in. So for example, in this color wheel, if we want to add up two colors, we can imagine there's a center point and the colors are at different angles. And if we want to know how to mix two colors, we take the angle bisector of that angle. So that's a basic math concept, which is now telling us something about the colors in this art. But you can see this, that like any model, what's what we, we use mathematics to model the world, and any individual model has you know, shortcomings because the, the real world is extremely complex and there's always another layer of complexity. We can always make our model more accurate. So this angle bisector model has some problems. If I want to mix blue and orange, well, that's a straight angle. So now all of a sudden, like there are two angle bisectors, right? There's the one that's going to come off this way and the one that comes off that way. Which one would we pick? Well, is orange and blue together make yellow? No, I don't think so. Does orange and blue together make magenta? I don't think so. So there's obviously a breakdown uh, in the model there. It only goes so far. And in fact, if you want to do something like maybe make a laser printer on which this color was printed, obviously the customer wants the colors to look like the colors that they thought were going to appear. And so you need to have a much more advanced model of color, uh, a mathematical model of color, so you know how much of the different toners to put down. And so that led to this little piece of mathematics, which very sadly I don't have time to go into the details of. This is called the kubelka monk equation. And this, this equation is literally from a paper written at Xerox when they were first inventing laser printers so that they could calculate how much of the different inks. So there's a lot of mathematics that goes into something as simple as printing out a color wheel on your laser printer.